The following program is paid for by Marietta F. Kammerer, who is solely responsible for its contents. This is Life Talk, where we tell it like it is. Life Talk is motivational, helping you get to the next level in life. Life Talk is educational to broaden your knowledge. Life Talk is inspirational to get you fine-tuned to start doing what you love doing. Life Talk, sponsored by KmarEducation.org. And here is your host, Marietta Kammerer. Well, good evening. Um, I'm Marietta Kammer. Welcome to Life Talk with Marietta. Uh, in tonight's program, we have exciting topics, but we have even more exciting news, how a local physician brings changes with solid solutions to our health problems, health insurance, and our wallets. Dr. Lee Forrest of Fairfield Family Physicians in Stratford, Connecticut, is with us tonight, and he is coming on shortly. But let me tell you about the other topics we're discussing tonight, uh, a roundtable discussion. Spiritual liberation in a high-paced society. And Nora Jaya, uh, she's a spiritual counselor, will join us around 7.45. So, um... Nora had a little bit of a delay, so she'll be with us just a little later. And um, uh, part of the experts uh, are Professor Christopher Hunter of Rice University and also United Way board member Rosa Carrera. So, children matter, parents matter. So we have some really serious topics we're going to address tonight because we're all trying to make a difference stepping in with our talents and skills to educate parents and children uh, starting at a very young age, but also educate the family unit. It takes a village to make changes. So we're starting off by welcoming our Dr. Lee Forrest of Fairfield Physician, Family Physician. Good evening, Dr. Dr. Lee Forrest, how are you? Great, thank you. Thank you for having me, Mary. Great. Now, breaking news. That's what I put down here on my notes. A new alternative to health insurance. Introducing tonight for the first time here on Life Talk, WICC 600, Dr. Lee Forrest. He is the um, owner of Fairfield Family Physicians, 2184 Main Street in Stratford. Better care at a better price. And Dr. Forrest, you have the floor. Thank you. Because I know it's your mission, and it's close to your heart. Absolutely. So I'm part of a growing movement uh, across the country um, of primary care docs that are sick and tired of the way medicine's being run. And um, this is direct primary care. This is where the doctors just directly connect with their patients and don't uh, deal with insurances or, um, or any other form of, of payment. And um, it's growing rapidly throughout the country. It's grown in the past, I think, uh, three years. I think it's grown uh, 600%. So um, this is where the doctors um, have decided that, um, you know, dealing with the insurances, dealing with all the middlemen is more of a hindrance in good care uh, than, than just dealing directly with their patients. So we've really gone back to the good old days of medicine. Um, in my office, for instance, we charge one small monthly rate, $60 a month, and we give a patient all their care, all their visits, physical exams, EKGs, blood tests are included throughout the year. So if a patient has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or diabetes, they're going to get all of their blood tests taken care of that, that are related to that. And, um, and also when a patient needs medication, we look to get them the most inexpensive medications. We do internet searches wherever we can get it cheaper for them. And beyond all that, um, when our patients need specialists, we know all the specialists in the area that are going to charge our patients much less for their care as well. So um, the savings can be uh, 80 to 90 percent uh, compared to other physicians that they might seek. And um, We've put together a really nice package for our patients. Uh, beyond that, each visit in the office is 30 minutes long. So there's no more five-minute visits with your doctor. Uh, no more, oh, hey, things are going good. Keep taking your pills. Goodbye. And if you have other questions, you know, um, in other offices, you would get, well, give me one or two of your problems and then come back for another visit. That's not how we operate. We 
you know, if you had 10 problems, we're addressing 10 problems at that visit. So we give p patients better care in that regard, more time, um, and the, the fees are much less expensive than, um, than people would pay elsewhere. And if they do our monthly program, they can get thousands of dollars worth of care for, let's say, seven or $800 a year. Um, tremendous savings in that regard. Doctor, could you please give us a scenario, let's say for instance somebody who, and I know Rosa has some questions for you too, um, somebody who has a high deductible. Let's see, what's a high deductible? $5,000, $10,000? Well, almost everybody these days has uh, high deductibles on their insurance. Um, $3,000, $5,000. I've even heard of ten and $12,000 deductibles and, and even higher. And that's most everybody these days. And so, um, you know, in that respect, people who have insurance, they really don't have insurance. They have a fancy insurance card, and uh, it's costing them a lot of money. And when they need to go for care, they're still paying out of pocket for all their visits. So that's where, where we come in, and our charges at, let's say, $60 a month, somebody's going to pay, uh, you know, under $1,000 a year for all of their care through our office, all of their primary care. And that can be most times 80, 90, in some cases even 100% of all the care that somebody needs uh, you know, in that year. So just as a scenario, if somebody had a $5,000 deductible, they could go and get one test done at another doctor's office, let's say for instance a colonoscopy at the hospital, and their insurance would be charged $10,000. So they'll meet their, their deductible in one exam Whereas if they came to me and paid the monthly fee, they can get all of their primary care at, at our office. If they had to come twice a year or 10 times a year, it's all going to be covered. And if they needed, let's say, um, that colonoscopy, well, we have places where they can get that done for $1,000 rather than the $10,000, uh, you know, at the hospital. Um, and if they needed, let's say, um, a, a stress test, we have places where they can get that for between uh, you know three to four hundred dollars. So for maybe two thousand dollars, they could have had all their care at our office the whole year through, a stress test and a colonoscopy for two thousand dollars. Whereas just one of those tests elsewhere could have they could have met their five thousand dollar deductible. So in that regards, people save a tremendous amount of money. Um, people care. Um, what the, what their outlay is, and and uh, you just don't look at and, and read your insurance policies uh, hardly ever, but they do care uh, when the doctor says you have to do this, 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 and this. Uh, as long as they just give twenty dollars, you know, copay, and the rest they really don't want to know, and they get the the big surprise the, in the mail that. Oh, uh, the insurance only paid so much, and they have thousands of dollars now that they owe, that they owe. So that's when people we want to do a lot of education, not only here on air because you will be a regular um, life uh, talk contributor, but also you have educational programs to educate the pub public. You have that starting August the twenty second. It's always a Wednesday. So, and um, what is happening to our health and wallets, changing times, better care at a better price with Dr. Lee Forrest. So he will have that right in his office. Everybody knows where the uh, Stratford Library is. His, his um, office is right across the street, that beautiful historical house. That's his office. So what about people, and I know you're getting in a minute, I know, uh, people that have no insurance. People that have no insurance, it's, it, this is a total no-brainer that they're going to get so much care for a very good price. I mean, basically, it's less than your cell phone bill, and you have access, 24-7 access to a doctor and all the testing and all the things that we provide at our office. You know, what we've done with our program is really take medicine back to the good old days. We weren't satisfied with the way things were going with the pace that you had to keep in order to try to take care of patients. The five and seven minute visits just, just don't cut it. Pa patients require more and they deserve more of your time. So we went back to the good old days where we got involved with a program that gives patients more of our time and at a very reasonable price. 
and we even do house calls. So we've gone. I back was going to mention that. Yeah, exactly. We've gone back to the really good old days. You know, if somebody's sick at home and they can't get out of the house, we're there for them. So we're not uh, we're not operating on the same. That's in way incredible. That, uh, other doctors yeah. are these days. Rosa, I know you have a question. Well, my question is really a person who does have insurance. How do they work with you, particularly if, let's say, Medicare? Absolutely. I have some Medicare patients, mm -hmm. and um, there is some extra charge to them in that regard. However, it's well worth it to them because at other offices, they're just, uh, they're just a, you know, uh, getting shuffled through. They're just a cog in the wheel, and the, the, the doctors that are treating them, you know, want to get them in and out as fast as possible, where at our office, they're getting all of the attention they're getting all of the time for whatever their issues are that everything's going to be addressed at every visit and we spend you know a lot more time with our patients we get to know our patients better and um you know patients that appreciate that will will you know pay the small extra that it would end up costing them but everything that we do do can be paid for through medicare so any testing that we order uh, any specialists we send them to, everything else is getting paid for through Medicare. And we're actually part of a Medicare um, pilot project going on right now at our office to show Medicare how much this type of program can save Medicare recipients and save the taxpayers money. So um, these things have been going on at other parts of the country and um, Medicare found out that it saved money even when they paid $100 a month, they were saving tremendous amounts of money. Ours is, is basically just about half of that. So Medicare will surely see that this is uh, something that can So there save. is the extra six, the $60 out of pocket plus whatever you submit to no, we Medicare? Don't, no, we don't submit anything to any of the insurances. So our, our practice... Our practice is able to offer something like this at such a low rate because we don't deal with having to have a staff of people um, submitting bills and uh, you know waiting around hoping that we're going to get paid for something. We've done away with the extra staff involved in billing and we just work directly with our patients. That's allowed individual doctors to save anywhere from, the studies have been done, anywhere from 80000 to $200,000 is saved just in not having to employ all the extra people and getting paid, you know, five cents on the dollar and not getting paid at all. Um, we've done away with all of that. So Medicare, I'm still a little bit confused here. How do they work with you? Don't be confused. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, the Medicare recipient, the patient, mm -hmm. we just deal directly with the patient. So the patient... You know, you, they would maybe think about it as an extra cost to them, but what they're getting for that is so much more in the extra time with the doctor, with the extra attention, um, especially, this is especially true for patients that are homebound and they have no other doctors that have come to see them. Mm -hmm. And that reason is because Medicare reimburses so poorly, they, they don't reimburse well enough that a doctor is going to go out and do these types of things. So we've made it very, very reasonable um, for in the, in the neighborhood of $1,000 for the entire year, we go out and take care of patients right at home as well. So who's the we? Oh, I have, uh, I have myself, my office, my nurse practitioner working with me. Mm -hmm. so. But you said there's a group of people throughout the United States? Throughout the country, there uh -huh. are other practices. So okay. um, I'm actually part of a network of doctors, so in other states. In other states, this type of program has been going on for a long time, for 10 and 15 years. Um, down south, um, out west in uh, Washington, in North and South Carolina, um, other areas of the country have been doing this for a long time now. And uh, I'm one of the early adopters of this type of thing here in Connecticut. But this is really the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. I just want to say something. I remember going uh, to a new doctor uh, because I have some issues with high blood pressure and so forth. I've been taking blood pressure pills for a year and a half and it's still the same numbers. So anyway, um, I was ordered a whole, um, uh, what, what is it? When you order every, all, every blood test there is, right? Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I was afraid. I, almost, I, I live very close to the lab. And I almost went in there one day, but I never made it, uh, to really see what Medicare pays uh, and what 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 my outlay is. I'm not going to gen- generate a five, six, seven thousand dollar bill, and Medicare will only pay maybe eight hundred bucks. I got to work at McDonald's for crying out loud. Sure. No, and I never did it. So I never inquired what the what 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 my outlay. And I think we need to d- know that ahead of time before we go into labs and all kinds of stuff. Absolutely, and right. you know, you asked earlier about examples, and I'll give you a clear cut example. You know, people think that they have insurance and, oh, well, I have insurance, so that's just going to pay for everything. Well, a couple of years ago, I walked into the exam room and I saw a patient of mine and he was really unhappy. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, I just went for a colonoscopy. And I said, oh, okay, so what happened? You went to the hospital and it was five or six thousand dollars. And he said, no, doc, they charged my insurance ten thousand dollars and my out of pocket. It wasn't his deductible, it was what they call a coinsurance. Mm-hmm. So he ended up having to pay $2,000 out of pocket for That's that unreal. colonoscopy. Yeah. His wife with the same insurance came maybe six months earlier. Same insurance, same deductible, everything, and needed the colonoscopy. We sent her to the private doctors that we know, and her out of pocket expense was $90. Mm-hmm. So there's the difference. We know how to guide people through the minefield of overcharges and what's going on out there. And that's part of what we do. That's another added benefit to any one of our patients. We will find them the better way of taking care of things more economically and save them a tremendous amount of money in the process. We're talking to Dr. Lee Forrest. That's uh, spelt with one R only. Uh, he's at 2184 Main Street in Stratford. Now, his website is Dr. Dr. No, no doubt afterwards. So it's Dr. Lee Forrest with one R dot com. His hotline, I call it hotline. That's not what the doctor told me to say. Is uh, 203-378-9002. And please give the doctor a call tomorrow. And also, um, the doctor is on our WICC website. Go under... WICC specialty program. Uh, you will see his picture, and also you can click right to his uh, website and find out more information. And the doctor will be with us on a monthly basis, doing educating here on air, but also in his office. Coming up August 22nd, uh, what's happening to our health and wallets? Changing times, better care at a better price. Dr. Lee Forrest, it starts at 6.30 and it ends at 8. Of course, I'm going to be there as well. Uh, and uh, we're going to really educate the public, ta- a town at a time. So thank you so much, for uh, Dr. Forrest, for being here today. I know this was a shorter version of what you w- really want to say, but uh, that's okay for today. I would ask you to stay for the round table. I want to thank you for your information. Thank you for your questions, uh, Rosa. So uh, we're going for a quick music break. Um, give me some loving, the summer of 67 now. And uh, we'll come back with the round table. Uh, and with the experts. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I'm Marietta Kammer, your Life Talk host, and we're starting our roundtable discussion on kids matter, children matter, I forgot now, parents matter, I didn't forget. And joining us today uh, on the telephone is our friend and our professor, uh, Christopher Hunter of Rice University, Houston, Texas. How are you today, uh, Christopher? I'm doing well, Marietta. Glad to be on. How are you doing? Oh, not too bad. I'd like you to meet Dr. Forrest uh, here in in the studio. And also Rosa Carrera. She is a board member of United Way. 
And of course, the Professor um, Hunter has been with us for several months. And we actually started when the hurricane in Houston hit last year. That's how long we know we've known one another. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Well, um, I'm glad to be here. Um, good to meet you guys, and uh, I'm ready to talk. All right. Well, kids matter, parents matter. And I did a little research, and I saw Harvard University um, uh, study, and there the study is suggesting emotional education, a series of talking points for parents to discuss with their children. Uh, so, and of course... Um, um, they suggested one of many uh, they suggested um, romantic love what romantic love is and what it feels like and um, also lessons that they themselves have learned uh, from their own relationships now what do you say to something like that in terms of <clears throat> uh, emotional intelligence yeah, there, there, there are several uh, topics of, of discussion that, that have to be had. Um, one of the, the, the very first ones that, that I learned from my mother was uh, good touch, bad touch. And, and what, that, what that meant in terms of my interaction with my peers and with adults. And so uh, I would say that, that it is not only uh, important but it is imperative uh, that the, the parent hones in on helping their children to understand that. All right. Uh, and as I'm, I'm reading, you know, the article, um, uh, three major things that would stand in the way that the, the children don't take to what the parents are talking about. Uh, because the stuff that comes out of their parents' mouth is tarnished. Uh, or at least outdated information. So, um, mm -hmm. children have a problem with what the parents say. Now, we all have yeah. our own thoughts on it, but we like you to, you know, to open this up a little more, you know? Well, first of all, there, there is, and I've said this on your program a couple of times, uh, Marietta, there is a very big gap when it comes to intergenerational communication and relatability between um, those who are considered old of the older generation and young and young people, uh, one of the things that I really love about this topic of discussion as a whole is that we feel like it's a, a, a this generation type of thing, but these problems have spanned across generations for forever. So the one thing is, is that on the, the, the parents' end, because we as adults tend to forget uh, our own childhood, childhood experiences and what it meant to be a preteen or teenager and trying to navigate through that at a time where our peers' opinion matter above anything and everything else. And so we, we kind of think, oh, well, you know, we're, we're giving them sound advice. This is what we went through. And so they should be grateful and, and, and take the advice as is and because I I'm, I'm, I'm only have their best interest at heart when really there should be a conversation that's had between the parent and the child where you, you open up through your line of questioning and, and asking the, the, the child for their opinion and, and, and what they've experienced thus far in a tone that is non-judgmental, in a space that is, that, that is safe and they know, not, not just from you telling them that they're safe to speak freely, but they know it and they feel it deep down that they're safe. And so there's, you know, there's that from the parent's uh, point of view. And then as children, yeah, they do think, oh, well, you know, we, us young folks, and I'm saying us because I'm still, you know, in that category as well, we tend to think that we are invincible. We tend to uh, neglect uh, stories of, uh, and, and living vicariously through the eyes of others and our elders rather than 
uh, sometimes um, sitting at the feet of the elders and gaining their pearls of wisdom and being able to decipher between what is applicable for us in our life at that point and what is something that deals with that that elder uh, specifically, we, we we have we have a tendency to to uh, not be able to, to to wrap our minds uh, uh, around being able to do that, and so we 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 tend to think that oh that'll never happen to me because I'm on top of it, and so we get offended as young people. That you know, oh, you know, this is that that happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s, etc., and we tend to think that we have it all under control. And then there's the the elder who either chooses to talk at instead of speaking with exactly the, the younger person. And so, if if both ends are having problems with with being able to. Uh, kind of cycle between and understand the other generation and where they're coming from, then there's no conversation that can be had effectively. Yeah, the children are not um, well-versed in, in, a, in dialogues, neither are the adults. So what specifically do you recommend to parents? And I, um, b b before I let you speak, allow me to uh, remember when, when my granddaughter Sophia was on and she talked about... Yeah. Uh, I think you were on with us in that particular program. And she said, she said, I hate when uh, the parents say, uh, oh, I remember it used to be this and used to, oh, this music or that. Uh, I couldn't believe how forward she was. She said, we don't care. I don't care. She was very and forward. And they don't. Now, here's, now, here's the thing. What, we, what, I, what I won't do is I won't clump all... Uh, younger people into that category, just like I, I would caution myself to young uh, to to clump all of my elders. It really depends on the environment that was provided to the child by the parent. Okay, being raised in in a household with with my beloved mother, we were she she never spoke at us you know she was firm but she was fair mm -hmm. she she listened and she and, and that's that's what i learned as a young person and 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 thrive that's why i thrive because i watched my mother's example of listening asking questions for clarification sitting and letting me letting myself and my brother and my sister speak and then based on the information that she's been given by us, she would then deliver what her opinion is, and she would preface it by saying, listen, mom is here to support you no matter what. I want you to do what, it, what you feel is right, but here is the information, how I see it and how I understand it. So, and so yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, Go ahead. am I understanding this correctly? Uh, uh, we can, we should start the dialogue, dialogue with the child. If I was rising, raising a child today, I, I should sponsor. I should be a sponsor for their opinion. I think that's how exactly. I raised uh, when I worked with Max and Sophie. I always uh, worked with improvisation programs that required their opinion. So they're very exactly. fluent in giving their opinion. Uh, Rosa, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Well, I think that that point, is so Im that point is so important. Children today have may a wealth of information, maybe information that is not clear to them, but they have a lot of information from media, their peers, the school, and they're searching for that particular um, solution maybe to a problem. And my modus operandi with the kids that I've worked with and been involved with is to let them tell me what they want to see done. Because some of their ideas are really good. Some of their perspectives are really important. And I think it's not only listening to them, but also taking action. 
positive action because you cannot tell a child that you're going to do something and not do it because whatever it is, it's going to bring some hostility into their lives. Some of our children are going through a lot of different changes. They live in environments that are uh, fraught with uh, violence. Uh, there are children who are being abused and they might not be as expressive as other children. So how do we delve into that child is not for me to say because I'm not a professional in that field, but from a grandmother and a, a mother's perspective is working with them, giving them my love, giving them my understanding, and asking them, what do you think needs to be done? And, 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 and more often than not, I have heard the answers directly from their mouths. And I think this is something, Doctor, whether um, you've had such an experience, but it's important for us to acknowledge that they have talents, uh, that they have rights, but that they also have responsibilities, that all these go hand in hand, and we have to model it for them. Because as parents, sometimes we're modeling a different something. We're telling them what to do, but we're doing something different. That's exactly w w what it is, b because uh, we're learning from uh, experience. So the saying is twisted around. Uh, uh, what's the saying again? That one sentence? I read it today, and I, I, I didn't write it down. Uh, don't do as I s do as I say, not what I do, or something like that. Yes. yes it's yeah, it's You got to yeah. turn it around, because... I, as a child, will model exactly uh, what you're do what you're doing. I may not hear what you're telling me, exactly. but I will watch uh, what you're doing. Uh, so, and that's how I learn. But we really learn from uh, uh, when we exp when we go on the pa on the life path through our own experiences. But we pick up an opinion at some point through Facebook, Google, the you know the Google University. I call it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm being facetious, Google universities, everybody Googles today, Twitter, whatever. So the kids have, you know, we all have a certain opinion. So, and that brings me to the next question. Um, some kids, uh, some teens will listen more to peers than their parents. And it's only in a certain age group, um, Professor. Uh, what, what do you think about that? What do you say about that? Oh, uh, that's normal. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> it's normal, parents. Forever and ever. It's normal. It's normal. Listen, I love it. Listen, peer peer orientation is a real thing, Marietta. It is a real thing. Look, and it's not just a this generation thing. There, there has always been a time period, and it's usually during adolescence into our teenage years, depending on our personality type, depending upon the, the, the environment that's provided by our parents, et cetera. We, there is a time, and, 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 it's, and it's so funny because this was the reason why I started doing my elementary school speech and debate tournaments and camps. Because my mother asked the question, when I was a senior in high school, and she said, Christopher, since when did it become uncool to be smart? And I looked, I, I, I examined it from my teenage, um, you know, world at that time. And it's like, it's not cool because you get made fun of by your peers. And the worst thing to, to have happen to you is to have non-acceptance from your peers. That's, that's the worst. Even if you are not uh, Mr. or Mrs. Popular, even if you are not involved in a bunch of extracurricular activities, what have you, acceptance and the feeling of belonging within that environment, because do, let's understand this, other than the summer months, those people are, are, are the ones that you are going to see the most. You are in school with them every single day. If you are bused to school, like I was in the in, living in the inner city of Houston, you see them on the bus, you see them in class, you see them in the hallways. You like so their opinion 
shapes your world and your place within this little bubble. And because cause you also have to remember this, for teenagers, especially between 11 and, and I'd say 17, 18, a, a molehill turns into a mountain in terms of how they interpret things. Yeah. So, uh, go ahead. Professor? No, I'm, no, I'm, you, you go ahead. You go yeah. ahead. You go ahead. We're yeah. speaking with Professor Christopher Hunter from joining us tonight from Houston, Texas. And Professor, I'm asking you to um, please stay with us because we're going for a quick break because WICC has to pay their bills. So stay with us, have a little sip of iced tea, and we'll be back in, in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Don't touch me. <laughs> Non attorney spokesperson. Attention. If you've had hernia surgery and have experienced complications such as chronic pain, infection, wound reopening, mesh migration, bowel obstruction, need revision surgery, or other complications, you may be entitled to significant cash compensation. Hernia repair surgery is common and requires a mesh product to be implanted inside your body. In May of 2016, the manufacturer of a popular hernia mesh product issued a mandatory global recall due to product defects. If you've had hernia surgery and have experienced complications, you may be entitled to significant cash compensation. Call the Hernia Mesh Helpline now at 800-957-7062. Our experienced attorneys will fight to get you the compensation you deserve. You pay nothing unless we get a recovery in your favor. Time is limited to file a claim, so call the Hernia Mesh Helpline now, 800-957-7062. Operators are standing by 24-7. Call 800-957-7062. That's 800-957-7062. This is WICC 600. Warning, if you're drowning in debt you can't afford, do not let the credit card companies trick you into thinking that you have to pay it all back because you don't. What the credit card companies don't want you to know is that there's actually a way to get debt free without paying off your entire debt or going bankrupt. If you have $5,000 or more in credit card debt, you now have the right to let us settle that debt for a fraction of what you owe. For free information, call Credit Associates now. 1-800-600-2168. We'll even show you how much money you could save. If you can't afford to pay off all your debt, do not let the credit card companies trick you into thinking that you have to. Call Credit Associates now for free information on how to get debt-free faster than you ever thought possible without debt consolidation or bankruptcy. We depend on your success and offer a guarantee, so there's no risk. For free information, call now. 1-800-600-2168. That's 1-800-600-2168. 1-800-600-2168. Paid non-attorney spokesperson. Attention. If you've had hernia surgery and have experienced complications such as chronic pain, infection, wound reopening, mesh migration, bowel obstruction, need revision surgery, or other complications, you may be entitled to significant cash compensation. Hernia repair surgery is common and requires a mesh product to be implanted inside your body. In May of 2016, the manufacturer of a popular hernia mesh product issued a mandatory global recall due to product defects. If you've had hernia surgery and have experienced complications, you may be entitled to significant cash compensation. Call the Hernia Mesh Helpline now at 800-957-7062. Our experienced attorneys will fight to get you the compensation you deserve. You pay nothing unless we get a recovery in your favor. Time is limited to file a claim. So call the Hernia Mesh Helpline now, 800-957-7062. Operators are standing by 24-7. Call 800-957-7062. That's 800-957-7062. This is WICC 600. Marietta Camera. I'm your host, Life Talk on WICC here uh, in the studio with us, Dr. Lee Forrest. He is the doctor from Stratford. Um, and we'll get you to say a few words as well. And my good friend, 
Rosa Carrera. She is a board member of the United Way and Professor Christopher Hunter from Houston, Texas tonight. Uh, good evening again. Thank you, Professor, for making the time tonight. We were discussing uh, why peers are shaping... Wait a minute. Why teens will listen to peers before parents. Now I'm getting to why are peers... Why are peers shaping children's behavior? Professor. Well, <clears throat> simply put, you it's, it's, it's almost like... Um, what Ms. Rosa said, they are, they are, you know, following what is being modeled around them. And to go against what, what is considered to be the norm or what is trendy, et cetera, is to put yourself in a position to be outcast by your peers. And we already established earlier that peer orientation is a real thing and the opinion of of your peers is so very important to so many kids nowadays and it's always been that way right um rosa do you have yeah, well i just wanted to kind of ask dr hunter to help me through this because um maybe i've seen this dynamic um and maybe i'm interpreting it wrong but i see within groups of young people there's always an influencer there's so someone that it seems to guide the rest of the group to doing good bad or and usually it's either or it's not in between um and these influencers um have for me have leadership skills um and they might come out come from broken homes or or somehow but we do not recognize that as a a benefit and how do we as adults, Dr. Hunter, can help those influencers be important in the lives of these other kids that they that form a group? Leaders, leaders are, are taught how to be good leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so what, what you have to do is, is you have to do a couple of things. And this is just from what, what I've done when I've had, and I understand exactly what you're saying. Like, so in hosting the summer camps that I have for elementary school and middle school students who are participating in speech, debate, and theater, I often dealt with this. You find out who the leaders are and who those, and the people that are going to be influencers probably within the first 30 minutes to an hour of camp starting on the first day. So once you recognize that and you make the observation of where they're, 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 they're taking their influence and their leadership, then it is your job to teach that, that child how to lead. Okay? And it's, and it's based on empowering them first you know when they when they do something that is impactful and that and and that is a good thing you recognize them for that and that that becomes a behavior that everyone else especially if you don't have any other um you know alphas that are trying to to, to take that spot you 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 find that everybody else is like okay well if that's what uh, John is doing and he's really over there working on his speech and he's doing this and that and the other and Uncle Chris which which is my nickname that the kids end up giving me Uncle, Uncle Chris I don't know why but if Uncle Chris is saying wow like you know he's, he's hit that that's really good maybe we ought to be doing that because we they, you know kids will rise to whatever bar you as an adult set for them if you are a positive influence already mm -hmm. right if you've yes. already shown them respect and that you care and then you've taken uh, someone that they deem as a leader and empowered them and educated that that young that young person with with the and, and giving them the tools 
that they need for leadership, like, you know, uh, understanding how important it is to be punctual, understanding what it means to all to have control over your emotions at all time and how to navigate through those things, how to express them through how you, you know, you, you, how you communicate, etc. then it spreads like wildfire. I have a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I have a thought. How about if, uh, and maybe you have done this in some of your programs in camp, uh, how about if we have the students um, uh, make up uh, some mock rules on civilized behavior? Oh, uh, that's what we do. That's exactly. What we do. So, and, yes. and when a student goes against those rules made up by the that's peers, the what happens? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, peers, the peers correct that behavior without you having to do anything. Right. Because, because once you create a community among them that is, uh, that is uh, safe and, that every, and where everyone has agreed that, hey, these are the lines not to cross. Mm -hmm. and, everybody, and it's understood. The peers will correct any wrong behavior. You as the adult have to be there to facilitate it so that things don't get out of hand, so that people don't, you know, that no one says or does anything that is offensive. But other than that, they are governing themselves at that point. Yes, we do it all the time. You know what I label? So when we would have these camps, if, if, I find that a kid has returned to the camp multiple weeks at a time. I give that kid a label. And those, those groups of kids are called the old schools. Old schools are the, are, are the ones that have experienced the camp before. They, they know me. They know my, my counselors. They know what the general rules are. They know how we operate. And my old schools help my rookies navigate through how we run camp. And so if, the, if the, the, the camps are usually Monday through Friday, by Wednesday, my leaders, be they male or female, be they fifth graders or, or eighth graders, if they are focusing on, on the, the theatrical events or the public speaking events or the debate events, no matter what, across the board by Wednesday, my old schools are helping out my rookies and we're there just to facilitate growth and learning and answer questions. It's incredible because I'm I'm lis I lis I heard every word you said and I was thinking uh, and I like to put it into my mind when the, your peers shape um, the um, the teen's behavior versus the parent. And I know you're much closer to this than I am. So what is the effect if, if an adult, is even the teacher, a teacher is trying to, even though I read the article today, the, the article said that the teacher was trying to shape the behavior of a student that didn't work, called the parents, that didn't work either. So... I don't have it quite in my mind yet. I don't have that. Ex I don't work with children daily. So um, what happens to the child if, if you're trying to modify the behavior and the, the mother and father is working with the child to modify a certain behavior? What happens? I, I think that what, what ends up happening is, is that the, the, the mother and father or the, the parents of the child... Um, have to go to a professional, which I am not, um, to get the tools to do that, because and, and to navigate that. Because we we again, as adults, we have the, a, a tendency to think that we are above and beyond what these these young folks are going through, and so we forget. We forget the, the, the feelings that we had when communication between ourselves and our mother or ourselves and our father or both parents in the household, if you were blessed to have both parents, 
were off. But for me, I had I had siblings. So that example of your peers <laughs> are gonna correct you. You know, I had I had a brother who was extremely important and and, and poignant in my upbringing. You know, uh, my my mom would would say something and it would be law, and then my brother Marvin was the enforcer thereof. You know, oh man, you know, man, mom just doesn't understand. You, you know, just what whatever excuse I would have to you know be my you know teenage Christopher self, and he would be able to say, hey, you're wrong. Mom said this. This is this is why you're wrong, and you're gonna do it this way mm -hmm. because it's it's the right thing to do. Now this is my big brother. I look up to him. I I, I listen to him. You know, so oh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna fall in line. So it, it, it's it's one of those things where I would say they need to seek counseling from a professional that can give them the tools and model how they need as they need to, 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 to interact with their child as a parent. Mm -hmm. Rosa, do you have another question before we get off air? Well, not a question, but I, I think or, to paraphrase mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln, he said a child is a person who's going to carry on what you have started. And then at the conclusion of that quote, he says, the fate of humanity is in his hands, according to him. I would put her hands as well. So there is a level of trust that we must develop to exactly. make sure that the young people know that it's not because of them, because of us, but because of them that we're doing what we're doing. It, it, to me... Uh, And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, um, is that we have to invest in them, support them, provide the resources, and also acknowledge that they, have the, they are the ones that are going to go into the future where we might not be or will be in a situation where we will need their help. We will need the doctor, uh, like Dr. Forrest here. We will need the, the, the accountant. We will need the nurses. And they are the ones who are going to carry out that responsibility. Yes. And exactly. also, from that perspective, I think that from my perspective, we cannot leave out the aspect of spirituality in children. Uh, and model that for them. We're going to talk about that uh, at our next um, uh, next month, which is August 19th. Due to the Yankees playing, we we only have certain air time, so we're moved around a little bit. So, but um, uh, Professor Hunter, I just I love having you on with us all the time. Your wealth of knowledge and your passion just shines through, and uh, uh, it's just well, so. You know, I love I love kids. I love I love working with young people um, because mm -hmm. they 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 are so bright. Yes, and they have so much potential if you can invest in them. Like I am an example of that. I I appreciate the behavior and, and, and what my mother was able to, to instill in, in us. And, and so while I was not one of those teenagers that was easily influenced by my peers, I was actually the opposite. I was the one that was doing the influencing. I was always thrust into leadership yeah. positions. But that is because of the tools that Sharon and Penny provided for me and, and and it wasn't money it was her example mm -hmm. professor was, uh, i'm sorry to cut you short we're out of time but i do want to give okay. you a website impact communications llc dot com yes. professor oh it's dot net oh sorry i made the mistake so it's impact communications llc dot net professor hunter thank you so much for joining us thank from houston all. texas um we'll have you on next month thank you so much dr forrest thank rosa you. carrera uh board of united way thank you for 
everybody's skills and talents and your knowledge. And thank you. And thank we'll you. see you next month, thank August 19th. And please check out WICC's specialty page, Dr. Forrest. Good night. Good night. Good night.